so so much, Daniel. Well, uh, you know, how can I match that colourful introduction? Uh, is it, and I'm supposed to be saying the world, but apparently I'm just causing an awful lot of trouble uh, across the channel. But um, there we are. Um, it's tremendous pleasure to be giving this lecture in this exciting series and um, to be doing it during what is our second visit to Hong Kong now because we're on the way back from Sydney and we stopped off earlier. It's been absolutely thrilling to discover Hong Kong. I had no idea how impressive it was going to be, how utterly beautiful a place it is, how, how, how big and and how um, uh, resounding with um, so many extraordinary themes. Um, indeed, I tweeted that it was um, really like a modern polis, a modern um, city-state uh, in, in, in every, every way. And of course, it is now a world city and a global hub. And uh, for those reasons as well, it's, uh, it's a huge privilege um, to be speaking to you um, this evening. Alison and I, um, have been really welcomed and given a very, very exciting time, and we're immensely grateful um, for that. So, um, to turn to the, the lecture, um, Creation, Spirit, um, and Time, Towards an Ecological Personalism. Today, we are living in the midst of a gigantic, multifaceted paradox. In some sense, as Daniel's already mentioned, however scientifically disputed and imprecise, we have entered the age of the Anthropocene. This is a biological, perhaps a geological era, in which the sheer scale of human modification of planet Earth is so immense that we must regard it as epoch-making. Not just global warming, but other alterations to our habitat are so immense that they may have an impact for thousands upon thousands of years to come. And in the case of some of them, for example, the recent annihilation of a huge number of species of fauna and flora, they will have effects that are going to last forever. Just recently, we have learned that the polar ice caps are melting much faster than previously thought. Now, unstoppable rises in sea levels are likely to threaten cities like this one, um, built so close to the ocean. In many ways, it's a, a frightening prospect. This means that the scale of the impact of human actions exceeds anything that we might have previously imagined. But at the same time, the impact only occurs because as um, the French philosopher of science, Isabel Stengers, has put it, Gaia, or nature, has proved to be an immensely touchy goddess. She is manifestly offended and has responded with drastic modifications to her normal and eons old established behaviour. It follows that our new awareness of the sheer possibility of human action is matched by an equal new awareness that nature is not just active, but also reactive. Or rather, it's more accurate to say that there are multiple different natural realities which react in all sorts of different ways, not all of them by any means predictable. But if there is already something approaching paradox about this double realization, the real paradox consists in the fact that new awareness of our capacity to change things seems to require us, just because this capacity has proved to be so overwhelmingly destructive, to repent of our anthropocentrism just at the point where its at least partial reality has been most evidenced. The negativity of this evidencing appears to reveal a far greater need to acknowledge our dependency on the actions of other natural beings which we can never fully control, to attune ourselves more to those actions, and to become much more aware of the possible unintended negative consequences 
of the ways in which we habitually act. All of those imperatives are now undeniable. And yet, I want to argue, they do not in any sense require a total rejection of anthropocentrism. For one thing, as the, another French philosopher, Bruno Latour, says, this would be simply absurd in the face of the fact of the Anthropocene. For this is not a kind of anti-ecological fact, but a supremely ecological fact. It is most of all characteristic of ecological thought, as Pope Francis points out in his encyclical Laudato Si, that everything is more complexly connected than we suppose, that there are always more and greater contexts and unexpected links across vast distances. This relationality of the real is almost infinitely ramifying. Part of this complexity is modes of feedback so drastic that this very word feedback is a misnomer. Feedback is generally part of the system in the first place. Thus, James Lovelock and others have discovered that the atmosphere and the geology of the Earth are not just a background to or an environment for biological occurrences. Rather, it is the case that plants and animals themselves, in part, sustain their own context. Oxygen, for example, is not fortunately just there for living things. It is rather there because of the dominant emergence of particular sorts of living things. In this context, we cannot regard human beings either as simply living in an environment which would be there anyway without them. To the contrary, the age of the Anthropocene proves that the human cultural modification of nature can become so fundamental as to reconstitute this background altogether. Nor is this modification necessarily just negative, even if it is today and becoming overwhelmingly so. Although some of this work remains highly controversial, scientists are starting to ask whether the human constitutive feedback loop is altogether new. For example, it may be the case that the relative climactic and geological stability of the Holocene era had something to do with the global human practice of agriculture, which tended to regularize and pacify the agonistic interactions of living things with each other and with the earth itself. Another obvious reason for not condemning anthropocentrism outright is that if humans have got other living things into this current mess, only human beings can get them out again. Thus, as again human Bruno Latour argues, it is human beings alone who can politically represent, as it were, the just claim of elements like water or of threatened species of animal and plant life. And they will naturally do so locally alongside their representation of local human interests and the local built environment. As Pope Francis again stressed in his encyclical, natural and human ecology belong together, not just politically, but also naturally. Once more, it is Latour who rightly says that it's not, for example, that there is a natural level at which water exists, and then a human usage of water level, and then a level of scientific expertise about water, unless we've artificially become the victims of neoliberal globalizing rhetoric. Instead, for a genuinely ecological point of view, all these levels are intertwined in different ways, in different regional and local instances. And that might include also a mysticism about water. Thus, it's not at all genuinely ecological to reject the crucial and conscious role of humanity. Not ecological, because this would be to miss the primacy of radical feedback 
and of relationality. For the interconnected view of things cuts both ways. Yes, human beings are situated within natural networks, and it's only capitalist arrogance which thinks we can treat the water, land, and other living beings as things to be commodified and exploited. We cannot do so without dire consequences to ourselves. But at the same time, we should not think that there is something called nature which is just pre-given as a background environment, a background that we must simply respect and obey. That this would be a mistake can be simply illustrated by the fact that humanly untended, uncoppiced woodland tends to develop such thick foliage that the undergrowth is stifled. It appears then from this example, which can be variously instanced, that the ecological approach is a third way, if you like, between pure wilding on the one hand, though that may have its regional place, a non-attuned and disrespectful treatment of forests as sheer resource for profitable human purpose on the other. Um, the very long Chinese tradition of both respecting and carefully cultivating um, a landscape regarded as sacred is in this respect of great importance for the whole human future. In much broader theoretical terms, it is um, a mistake um, because to think of nature as a fixed, given background against which we weave our various cultural designs is to repeat the very error which led us into ecological disaster in the first place. Most of the really sophisticated ecological thinkers like Latour, Timothy Morton, Michel Serre, and Bernadette Stiegler concur in saying this. For it is the notion of a fixed and independent nature that has caused us to think of nature as a kind of vast, inert resource. It is the ignoring of the sheer, untotalized multiplicity of nature that has persuaded us to overlook the fact that the natural world is full of many different and not always fully harmonized agencies with which we have to reckon. Thus, imagining that our cultural action is not part of nature, and imagining that nature is purely unified and inert, obedient to unchanging and ahistorical laws, are two halves of the same deluded picture. Originally, this picture was created in the Christian West by a false and idolatrous late medieval and early modern theology of creation, which imagined that God was a literally individual and tyrannical supreme being who controlled and manipulated a sheerly mechanical nature, a dead nature. But ironically, just the same view is presented in a secular guise by reductive physicists who ignore the lessons of quantum physics and by neo-Darwinians who overlook the increasing collapse of the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Nature is regarded as entirely predetermined from the outset in denial of the increasing evidence of its multiple and various spontaneous agency. Instead of a pre-planning and designing God, we have the notion that a vast series of independent mechanical actions engender in the end an order that appears to have been designed by a single hand, just because it is still thought of as engendered by a single law. From Darwin himself onwards, this was simply the projection of the principle of liberal political economy into extra-human reality. And today, to think in terms of a need to surrender to a supposedly fixed and perfectly unified natural order is both dangerous and actually unecological. It would, as Timothy Morton declares, in reality engender a tyranny even more terrible than the one we may soon be living under. For it would be ruled by global experts claiming to determine the ecological optimum in terms of maximal sustainability. But it's again unecological to imagine that there is any such possible calculability 
as Morton goes on to argue. Because natural connections are infinitely ramifying, and because nature can be spontaneous and unpredictable, all we ever have to go on are good guesses and situated, well-attuned local hunches and intuitions. For the very best scientific reasons, however, they are more likely to be reliable. And sustainability as the main criterion is itself, one could argue, too instrumentalist and so again unecological. Sustainable for, who, for whom and for how long? And how can we fully know what will ultimately prove most sustainable? If sustainable only for a few years, then is that necessarily bad? Does the sustaining of some people and some creatures, at least for a time, not matter? Of course, the provocation of this question is not supposed to deny the importance of asking whether short-term sustainability is worth the risking of immense long-term damage. Another and still more crucial point here is whether the whole idea of sustainability is not all too likely to be commodified and marketized. In fact, that's already occurring. Our approach needs instead to be more indirect. Were we to focus much more on producing the beautiful and enjoyable rather than any sort of maximization of a criterion, however benign in appearance, then it is likely that of themselves, as Roger Scruton suggests, the beautiful and the enjoyable would involve much more attunement with what surrounds us and the realities into which we enter. For again, to think in terms of the merely pre-given is wrong. If we do that, then we will suppose that there is a realm of natural laws on the one hand to which we must submit, and on the other hand, one of culture which can only be a matter of technological manipulation, of making things go faster and slower, rendering them ever larger or smaller, ever more transmissible and reproducible. But to the contrary, if reality is interrelational, if we are supreme actors within a vast realm of other actors, then ecology is rather a matter of shared creative labour in a solidarity extending beyond the human. For ecology, the logic of our shared worldly household is not a protest against change in the name of stasis, nor even a protest against the right sort of economic growth in true flourishing for all, as opposed to the accumulation of abstract, abstraction everywhere and enclosure um, also. Rather, it is a protest against the suppression of real, creative, artistic, and aesthetic change constantly for everyone on the part of a scientific culture in league with an economic and bureaucratic approach that tries to reduce everything to future predictability, to profit and control and micromanagement. Just for this reason, ecology also is not committed to the idea that the resources of the planet are finite. To the contrary, just because these resources are temporal and self-renewing, they are serially infinite. As in the case of capitalism in general, so with the capitalist exploitation of nature, scarcity is something humanly produced in order to stimulate competitive demand and increased profit. As Morton points out, more natural and low carbon modes of energy can actually power a far more inexhaustible range of human activity. As he rather amusingly puts it, he says that in his eco house in Texas, he can have a non-stop disco going day and night with Michael Jackson, no doubt, and everybody else blasting out everywhere. Uh, I, I wouldn't go that way myself. It wouldn't be quite my taste. But you can see his point. He's trying to say ecology is not a kind of ascetic matter. So often it's presented to people like that. And that's one reason why it doesn't gain any popular traction. So far, I've tried to present the best secular ecological thought in a positive guise. But there are some problems with it, which I'll come to presently in conclusion. Before then, I want now to ask, how might all this chime with the traditional Christian, Jewish, and Islamic theology of divine creation ex nihilo, and also with 
some of the ancient religious wisdom of the Far East. As John Paul II already intimated, a modern awareness of historical and evolutionary change requires us both to rethink the doctrine of creation and to rethink it in a way that renders it more radically true to itself. Indeed, St. Augustine already saw that there's a link between creation and the primacy of time. If God creates out of nothing, then he does not first of all create a spatial framework against which background all later happening is fixed, such that its apparent novelty is pure illusion. That's the false picture offered by bad theology and bad science, including a merely Einsteinian physics that does not want to reckon with the unpredictabilities of irreversible time that quantum physics presupposes. But for Augustine, time has a certain primacy because everything continues to emerge from nothing with a divine force of novelty. In this way, every creature is first of all constituted by time spans, as he puts it, by retention, presence that never stands still, and projection of the future. The inner reality of all creatures, as early described by Augustine in his treatise De Musica, is most intense in the human creature, where it is consciously experienced, as later described in the Confessions. In this way, there's a link between ontology, anthropology, and continuous divine creation. But as John Paul II intimated, it's a legitimate mark of our modernity to go further than this, and yet in consistency with inherited Christian doctrine. If everything is created out of nothing, then each thing is reflexively in itself only that act of creation without any receiving passive base. To be created by God is in a weird way to be only self-creating. The divine power is most of all and most consciously realised in the human creature who becomes thereby a conscious, self-creating, participatory co-creator. In this way, we can think theologically our contemporary paradox. Just because creatures as creatures are participatively self-creators, theology does not need to endorse any false notion of a fixed nature, which I've been denouncing. Theology has always known or half known that the created universe is rather one of multiple actors in shifting relationships and that the world is only a unity at all through the divine grounding. It doesn't otherwise have a boundary, as it were. At the same time, theology endorses an unabashed anthropocentricity because it understands that human creative action reaches furthest both for ill and for good, though never in fantasised independence of all other creatures. That fantasised independent action, which is merely technological, is actually not really creative at all for the reasons that we have seen. In this sort of context, philosophers and theologians today are often looking again at the thought of the early 20th century French philosopher who inspired so much of modernist art, Henri Bergson. Reading Bergson through Augustine, we can say that he realised that our direct inner experience of remembering, thinking, loving and hoping was also the best clue to the ultimate reality of all finite things. That, of course, is to construe things from the top down rather than reductively from the bottom up. Reading Augustine through Bergson, we can say that it is our experience of ourselves as constantly inspired or creative that gives the best clue to the ultimate powers behind everything in the natural world. Bergson rightly suggested that experimental science is probably and austerely limited to exploring the two fait, the already given, even if this includes the predictable operation of recognised spontaneities. It can't really account for the radical changes that we undoubtedly see in the subhuman historical world 
as well as within human history. It may well rather be that it is human feeling, human imagination and inventiveness, processes always more fundamental for us than any logical reflection, that much better intuit the most fundamental imminent realities of absolutely all realities in the creation. Bergson, for these reasons, rejected total mechanism. But he also rejected total teleological finalism, if one means by that a doctrine whereby physical reality is following a kind of pre-inscribed and imposed plan. That would be as much a case of obeisance to the pre-given as the iron rule of mechanical law. But in an obscure way, Bergson suggested that a process of groping towards ever more sophisticated and flourishing ends is at work in the natural world. Theology can perhaps better understand this, as Pope Francis requires at the end of Laudato Si, in terms of the participation of human creativity, not just in the externally creative divine action, but also in the supremely dynamic and yet supremely restful life of the divine trinity. For God the Father himself does not contain a fixed plan to which the Son and the Spirit are subservient. Instead, the Father's reasoning is nothing other than his full realised expression in the ars or art which is his Son, as both St Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas put it. And the Father's initiating life is nothing other than the Spirit's interpretive reception of and response to this art of the Son. This third moment and binding shows how, as it were, the paternal expression in the Son is both infinitely complete and yet mysteriously not complete after all. Thus the radicalism of the doctrine of the Trinity consists in the fact that it does not negate or cancel the creative processes of groping towards the end of the labour of finite agents, nor the endless reading of the products of labour which constitute community as reception of and circulation of gift, but rather is taken as realising that process eternally and infinitely. It follows that we do not share in and echo God according to our fixed a priori notions, nor are merely abstract theoretical surmises, but by our hoping and striving and reconsidering and re-relating projected into the future. Is the doctrine of creation, however, just a superfluous icing on the cake of secular ecological thought? One can argue that it's much more than that. For even the best secular ecological thinking seems to face metaphysical conundra that it can't really resolve and which can also have practical consequences. As we have seen, it now seems clear that evolving creatures do not just adapt to pre-given environments. Instead, they actively shape them and apparently anticipate them in advance. In that case, as Bergson already argued, we have to allow that the spontaneous action of natural things shows a kind of bias towards form, towards mutual attunement, and towards certain preferred forms rather than others, as manifest in phenomena of convergence to the same biological modes and idioms from different starting points, as with the case of the animal eye, as controversially argued by Simon Conway Morris, the Cambridge biologist. But how are we to understand all this without some sort of finalism, albeit not of the controlling in advance variety? If this requirement is denied, as it appears to be both by both Latour and Morton, then one is surely back with an accidental harmonisation of random spontaneities. It is all very well to say that there is no whole of nature in control of everything, apart from the shifting relations of its constituents. But finite, as opposed to the divinely substantive Trinitarian relations, 
a relations between things with some excess over relationship, while the relative stability of certain patterns of relating themselves compose further holes. The globe itself is, after all, at least a relatively closed entirety, even if such enclosure and closure and coherence is always a mystery in excess of the norms of classical logic, since what binds anything together is incomprehensibly both a part of that thing and yet not a part of it. In theological terms, it is, one might conjecture, the mysterious work of the spirit. And this kind of exceeding of um, classical logic was often taken much further by Mahayana Buddhist thinkers, supremely by Nagarjuna, than it was by anybody in the West. Even if, after Latour, each single thing can be taken to be infinitesimally a kind of concealed society, a hidden web of yet further relations, a monad containing ever further monads, one still faces the problem of the monad's unification and the way it can perhaps sign its infinitesimal constituents with its own peculiar character all the way down. And if monadic societies are also holes, then why not also intermonadic societies, all the patterns of relating that appear on the Earth's surface? Are there not indeed things that we can call hyperobjects, like climatic systems, as Timothy Morton argues, even though he rather inconsistently tends to refuse all notions of encompassing wholes? For both Morton and for Latour, parts are taken to be more than the whole, because parts can always escape any containing set and set up new and bigger holes on their own account, as all of modern mathematics has taught us. Well, quite certainly they can, and this truth paradoxically breaks with the unspoken claim of a whole to unbreakable inclusion, to a transcendence of the parts. And yet the relative truth of inclusion, which we see all the time, otherwise the world would just, things in the world would just shatter apart. The, the unspoken claim of a whole to unbreakable inclusion, to a transcendence of the parts. The relative truth of this inclusion is also a paradoxical truth, as earlier argued. Else no things whatsoever would hold together with relative strength. There would be, in fact, quite simply, no things, even if the very existence of things, as so many object-orientated philosophers are arguing, is an enormous mystery. The existence of the globe or of the world as a whole is no more or less a problem than the relative self-standing of a tree or a ship in Hong Kong Harbour or um, the very tall buildings here that sway without falling during tornadoes, I'm told. If these things can hold together, why not, can we not talk of a mysterious holding together of everything? In these ways, secular ecological thought seems to oscillate awkwardly between a primacy of relation on the one hand and a primacy of a myriad variety of substances or of things on the other. It also hovers awkwardly between a primacy for process in time, which seems ontologically to subordinate particular things, and a primacy once more of isolated and newly arriving things, with time reduced to something of an illusion. Their arrival without a governing process then seems obscure, and can even require some version of a theory of pre-established harmony, if it is to be explained at all. In the face of these various perplexities and others, Bruno Latour rightly seeks in all such instances to find a medium between sheer reduction and sheer elevation in terms of the process of scientific explanation. Things are not just their parts. 
nor, however, are they outright more than their parts. Likewise, natural causes should be regarded as somewhat animated in character, and yet not fully so. Through this theoretical moderation, the tour generally means that experiment discovers typically a new actor, like Louis Pasteur discovering yeast, as opposed to a pure vitality of a previously known compound on the one hand, or a merely mechanical action on the other. Yet this raises perhaps unanswered questions about the link of a parasite like yeast to the host and of the admitted connections between different vital spontaneities. Given these connections, can we totally dismiss the singleness of an imminent vital process, an élan vital, as entertained by Bergson? And surely the real middle way in terms of animation is not the pluralization of agents, but rather their degrees of real agency. That is to say, the natural world rather evidently admits stratified degrees of spontaneous power, from the physical through the chemical, to the biological, to the animal, to the human. In this way, the middle path seems to require hierarchy, which modern ontological democrats including all the people I'm talking about, are extremely loath to admit. But if one does not admit hierarchy, then either democracy is achieved by a mechanical dumbing down or by a sheerly uniform and over-processed biased vitalist raising upwards. Yet it's clear that Latour rightly wants neither and rightly thinks neither to be scientific. It's just by virtue of this hierarchy that human beings are not the only agents, perhaps not even the only persons in the universe. Yet, nonetheless, they are most of all agents, and they are most of all persons. And as we now know, they can be personal agents in the most terrible sense. However, even the best secular thought finds it very hard to admit this and therefore still tends to veer between a sheer perspectival anthropomorphism in the wake of Kant and a sheer naturalism which would deny any human or even any animal or chemical uniqueness. This is because metaphysical immanentism needs to produce an immanent absolute in the place of God, either man or nature. Latour certainly sees this. But only with huge ambivalence does he suggest that we therefore cannot remain in pure imminence. Indeed, at the political level, Latour wants a kind of constitutional democracy to arise between the scientific proponents of imminence on the one hand and the religious proponents of transcendence on the other. But wherein could any such compromise possibly lie? It would only be a Hobbesian liberal formalism once more, not the sort of thick, relational, open-ended global network of integral places without any sovereignty that Latour rightly desires. Instead, I think, theology must boldly say that secular thought cannot resolve and, um, and it cannot just pretend to evade the aporias of relation versus thing, of process versus substance, of part versus whole, and of unique human spirit versus natural solidarity of all creatures. For theology, as once for Plato, these perplexities are the signs that indeed finitude makes no sense whatsoever on its own terms. It only makes any sense as a series of enigmatic symbols that declare its participation in the infinite. Therefore, Latour, Morton and others are still more right than they know. There is no imminent closure, there is no nature, there are no absolutely worldly wholes, or entities, or parts, nor foundational causal processes, nor comprehensible unities of things, nor understandable motions, nor even any ultimately foundational actor network of relations that fully makes any sense. As, again, the great historical thinkers like Nagarjuna um, 
understood much more clearly than Western thinkers in the past. Within immanence, we are teasingly shuttled between all these poles, because all of them are mere totem shadows, only real as reflecting the light of God, which, however, they themselves creatively impart ignites and beam forth. They are this self-ignition and conveyed further radiance. And the fully conscious self-ignitings and outbeamings, which are human persons, both lie entirely within the world and yet are able to transcend it, to look down on it as a tiny nut, as both St. Benedict and the English Saint Julian of Norwich declared. A better ecology, beyond even Latour, would allow at once that human beings are enclosed within the world and that they can exceed it, that the duality of the globe as both real container and surveyable round map is not wrong, if nonetheless aporetic and problematic. For it is by virtue of the survey of the globe from an imagined afar that humans are indeed able to be its stewards and its gardeners in the wake of Adam, and rightly to try to name the beasts, not to dominate them. It is perhaps just for these reasons that the agricultural age and the age of the emergence of monotheism was not the beginning of ecological nightmare, as Morton and others claim, but as he indeed let slip out, the period of supreme ecological pacification, in theological terms of a certain undoing of the cosmological fall or of the golden age recalled by nearly all human cultures, East and West. It is this era, as the Catholic social doctrine of the primacy of the rural teaches, that we need to recreate in a higher and more technologically advanced guise, not that of the hunter-gatherers, who in reality often did fight each other in rival tribes and over-sacralized some parts and aspects of nature, while so devastating others as to create uninhabitable wastelands, probably like the Australian interior, which survives to this day. For the God of Christianity is not a super-totality or a super-globe. He is beyond totality and individuality. He is beyond whole and parts. And as Trinitarian lies also beyond the contrast of substance and relation, unity and plurality. As personalizing essence or Sophia, as the Russian theologian Sergius Bulgakov argued, the ground, he grounds all the pre-human vitally creative processes of nature. As three persons, he grounds also the spiritual life of human beings and angels, or no doubt of bodhisattvas, if you like. The equality of the persons grounds human democracy. The originating primacy of the father grounds the constant need for reversibly hierarchical birth, growth, and induction within time. The coincidence of essence with persons in God grounds the more ultimate equality of all created things with human beings. For even though humans are within imminence the supreme creators and guardians, they can only be so if they respect equally their complex situatedness, the equal creative supremacy of Gaia taken as a real, albeit elusive whole. Indeed, at the top of the scale beyond hierarchy, an unthinkable natural democracy of nature, a thearchy, as Dionysus the Areopagite put it, is from all eternity upheld. I think we need this philosophical and theological vision and to act on it if we are to save our planet. In order to do so, we must deny neither our higher human personhood nor our immersion in nature which, in another sense, exceeds us. We have to admit the superiority of person in one respect and of essence in another, as within the divine trinity from whom the creation pulls forth. In order to rescue other creatures alongside ourselves, 
We need to act paradoxically as their kinotic saviors, at once as architectonic coordinators, and yet also in humble partnership with them and in tune with the created wisdom of God or the absolute that mysteriously holds all of creation together. Thank you. Ask a few things. So you seem to be a very critical of uh, let's call modern logic in science at the moment, and you and you seem to want theology to do something that offers an alternative to that kind of thinking. I mean, you 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 you've done quite a big big critique really of, yeah. uh, and uh, at the same time you want this to be a kind of almost a creative artistic kind of reaction rather than a scientific reaction to the question of ecology. Can, can you kind of explain that? a little bit more. I mean, what do you mean by that? And what, what's being criticized here? And what's the alternative that you're opposing? Uh, yes, well, well, that's a big question. I mean, I, I began by kind of criticizing a too easy notion that the world is a kind of given unproblematic whole that we just have to fit into, which I think some ecological thinking um, take, takes that view. On the contrary, I think the fact that it's much more fluid and interrelational is part of the reason why we're able to upset you know, uh, the environment so much. And we, we have to, to take that into account. Um, but at the same time, when I started to think more theologically, I was um, wanting to say we, we shouldn't sort of abandon totally, entirely the idea that there is some kind of total unity of, of, of the world. Otherwise, what vision do we have about how we are all to fit together? It becomes instead something like a sort of liberal democracy for nature, as Latour is, is suggesting. And I said that one approach to that issue is to show that actually any thinking of any unity, whether we're just talking about an ordinary thing, um, is, is, is actually quite, quite problematic. Um, and. Uh, but, but, but certainly, I, w I was trying to suggest that uh, the, the solutions to our ecological problems aren't simply scientific. Um, uh, partly because all this is so completely uncalculable. There isn't some kind of master scientific program that's going to solve everything. It, it, the, our problems probably more result because of the way in which uh, Technology and science have got sort of disembedded from uh, human art and religion uh, and, 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 and from other concerns. And we need to, to re embed those, those discourses um, uh, in, in, in something, something much bigger. Um, and, and I think that uh, the way in which I'm suggesting that nature is really a quite uncertain process, that all, all science does, it's not wrong, but it, it studies its fixities, which are often only temporary, and then it sort of fantasizes there are laws and, and so on, whereas I, I'm suggesting that it, uh, after people like Bergson, that actually our, our, our emotions, our feelings, our, our more dynamic kind of creativity that's related to time may be sort of intuitively in touch with what's much more fundamental within the process of, of, of natural alteration. And, and this suggests, therefore, that the approach to ecology is something much more like getting in touch with what primitive people understood or traditional Chinese uh, people understood, that of getting in harmony with nature and, and realizing we are in a natural sympathy um, with, with, with natural processes. But it's, it's a sort of dynamic, co-creative, um, sympathy and and therefore the way forward is is much more to recover this kind of religious vision because it's really a purely scientific approach that has generated all this ecological crisis in the first place. Right, the, the kind of yeah, the kind of yeah, yeah. yeah. That is much more. Well, I think of these colleges myself. Yeah. With the cosmos, in many ways, the analogies I'm using are, are musical. Right. Right. This is why I was evoking right. Augustine. It's right. Music duration. Yeah. Right, that would go back to Pythagoras yeah. and also to Chinese uh, yes. uh, cosmos. I thank you, John, for your no. thought-provoking lectures. I'm not a Can you speak into the mic? So, uh, yeah, excuse me if, I'm, if my question is, you know, seems to be very much unprofessional. 
Um, my question, well, let's, let's, let's well, rather describe it as portrait as, as a three penny comments or reflections mm -hmm. upon your, um, you know, through your well, thought broken mm -hmm. lecture. I mean, start from creation ex nihilo in Latin or creation out of nothing. Yeah. I think that's a very um, reductive uh, later tradition uh, um, Christian idea um, of creation out of nothing because you know, if I'm not if I'm right in from uh, with the Jewish uh, Hebrew scriptures Barashib bara Elohim Hashamayim Biet Haris Baruch Hashanah something like that it was there was a primordial uh, materials of the water where the Ruach Elohim or the Spirit of God is was hurrying above before that spirit claimed, may there be light, and there was light, and the so-called seven creation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think uh, we, we do, in the Christian um, contextualization, um, the uh, uh, stewardship ideas, and also the guardian that the Adam and Hawa in Hebrew, or Adam and Eve in English, was bestowed by this uh, creator, well, the Hashem Adonai, which is the, uh, um, the deity in the Eden Garden, the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm to take care of the ecological system, which is the fundamental presupposition and the ideas that scale out the cosmological order between the top tier of the creation, which is the mankind, in relation to the world, which is the creation itself, the materialistic world, the non-intellectual world. But the thing is, um, I'm, my, my three penny thought come from the perspective of the dichotomous realistic worldviews and the cosmological presupposition of the monotheistic or the Abrahamic one God traditions. I mean, in the Kadif or in the Hebrew Torah or the Mishnah, Kabbalah, Midrash, and also the Synoptic Gospel, we all have this idea of the creation and the creature, the creator or Mawan or the Trinitarian or the second person of, person of the Trinity of, well, whichever kind, Allah, whatever, in relation to that appointment of the stewardship of mankind mm -hmm. to master and take care of the creation. I mean, we can be good or bad in that role of job. Yeah, yeah. Brief. Yeah, brief. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll try it's to make very it. Interesting. very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, so you allow me to, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll try question. to make it brief and to just elaborate a little bit to, yeah, yeah. to um, I mean, we have been put on that position, but you know, despite all the uh, clockmaker theories, there can be divine intervention or punch or retaliation by the tsunami or whatever in response to our bad stewardship from time to time. And it happened, it did happen in India, in, in Hong Kong recently even. Yeah. Um, but in comparison to this dichotomous, dichotomous dualistic worldview of, of cosmological presupposition in the monotheistic Abrahamic traditions, in the Oriental transcendental traditions, we normally presuppose that you know, the cosmological order and the logos way, the rationale of the universe, the, it's distinctive but not separate from the universe itself and it's within us. Yeah, no, so the yeah. two are one. Yeah, yeah. Let, and, let, and how do you think of that? Well, these are huge questions, but uh, let me try and respond briefly. Yeah, so yeah. what I would say is that you've got it precisely the wrong way around. Yeah. It's absolutely the idea of creation ex zero that rejects every possible dualism. Because in, if, if, if you have the idea that there's as the Greeks did, that there's a sort of rational shaping force and there's a material chaos, that is inherently dualistic and it tends to, to be crude, to sort of make matter subordinate. But the point of um, creation ex nihilo is that absolutely everything, including matter, you know, fully comes from God. And uh, I think you'll find that in the Bible itself, that the wisdom books and then Judaism and then later Christian traditions sort of read that receptivity rather differently. They, they read it in terms of the wisdom tradition, that the first created thing by God is wisdom. So it's as if God can only create through an initial grateful reception, if you like. So that, that it's a sort of spiritual creation from the outset, that everything, is, because everything is gift, Everything is originally gratitude. It's not a kind of dead reality, if, if you like. Now, trying to relate this to Oriental traditions would be massively complex, but I think one can have a fruitful debate uh, in terms of you know, the idea of a creation out of, of nothing, 
and, and, and uh, sort of various Buddhist ideas that there's an emptiness at the core of things, which probably doesn't mean a kind of literal emptiness. And, and we can see how there's a sense sometimes for people like Eckhart in the Christian tradition that the, the nihil is, is also reflecting something negative in God, that, that there's something um, you know, beyond being as, as we know it, you know. So the, there's all kinds of room for creative discussions at, uh, at that point. Um, there's a question there, and also two questions, one on both that side. Thanks, Professor Milbank, for uh, offering an alternative. I interpret your view to be that you, you, you talked about Gaia, right? It seems yeah. that you appeal to the dynamics of our emotion towards nature mm -hmm. as your alternative. But I think in today's secular world, how, because the, the problem as I see it is that there are countries who want to maximize their economic growth and they're in competition. And if I lower my greenhouse gas emission, then I will lose out. And that's the, an economic, economical problem, right? How do you appeal to them uh, in uh, pursuing your alternative? Well, of course, you know, that's a thousand dollar question. Apparently this year, carbon emissions are predicted to be uh, at the highest level ever. <laughs> but at the same time, um, you know, a country like China, it, it more than the United States, in fact, is, is getting hold of the idea that, that growth needs to be green in, in the future. Um, beginning to get hold of the idea that, that actually, and quite quickly, even in purely economic terms, it can be completely detrimental to organize, to ignore these, these, these kind of effects. And that, you know, very quickly when, when we get sort of weather disasters and so on, they can be um, very expensive. Um, but I am suggesting that, that that's not going to be enough, you know, and that... Um, Various forms of techno, you know, merely technical fix could um, lead to uh, a, a maybe a kind of totalitarianism in, in the name of ecology. And that if you want people to, to have a change of heart, if you like, something like a re religious repentance, I think people are very put off if, if you present this in terms of this, you know, disaster scenario and. Um, you know, you have to sort of have a quantifiable checklist of everything you're doing uh, and, and, and so on. It, it, and, and, and your response has to be very, very ascetic. Um, I, I, think, I think instead, if, if you um, um, presented them with the idea that an alternative more ecological way of life can be much more exciting, much more fulfilling. And if you presented it much more in terms of um, one's immediate aesthetic relationship to one's own, own environment, if, if, people, if you say to people, well, you don't want, you know, there no longer to be um, undiseased trees around you, you know, um, you no longer, you, want, you don't want to see all the birds vanishing. So I think in encouraging at a micro level the, this, this sort of appreciation of nature uh, and a, a re-sanctifying of landscape and this sort of thing is more likely to be uh, fruitful and, and to bring about a long-term change of the way in which we regard things. Thank you. Well, thank you. This question there. My question was a fairly simple one. Um, when we hear that thousands of species of plants and animals are going extinct or have gone extinct, the usual reason that you hear is, well, this was a potential benefit to men, to humankind. All the possible biology, bioantibiotics and so forth that could have been derived from them. Or it's a kind of sentimental uh, value like oh, the rhino, we don't want the rhino to disappear. Or as you just said, we don't want the, all the bird species to disappear. And it seems like neither of those really has the grounding in the kind of thing that you were talking about, that is that they have the right to exist themselves, in and of themselves. And it seemed like that could only come from some kind of religious or theological basis. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, th I, th I think it's a really great question. And I was suggesting that we need a kind of difficult balance be between the sense that you know, things exist for themselves and they have a right to exist 
for, for themselves. And yet, that there's something special about, about human life uh, and uh, the human ability to appreciate this rich diversity. And I think we've um, got, to, got to appeal to, to both things. But also, we, um, outside the two points you make, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that um, there comes a point where if you are, um, say, damaging um, the variety of bird life or insect life, this, this really does damage the, the ecological network. It really, it really does endanger the ability of nature um, to survive. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it has to, nature will respond. It will take sort of em, emergency measures, um, if you like. But um, it, it, it will then, in losing its diversity, perhaps become much more alien, much more ferocious. This is, if you like, the kind of, uh, the reflex divine punishment, uh, which I don't mean that quite literally, but I do mean there is an order to things which if you ignore, um, the, the, there will be consequences. And I think, I think this is one reason why um, you need a sort of subsidiarity in, econo in ecology. The, the more you focus on the ability of local systems relatively to survive within themselves, the less you need to reach towards the, 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 the kind of merely to the big level, which is going to be sort of inherently more fragile and can become threatening. More questions. Um, question there. And then we have some questions at the front here. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about this notion of kenotic personalism, this idea of self-emptying, particularly with reference, I suppose, on St. Thomas Aquinas' day, to the notion of virtue and specifically to the politics of virtue, to coin a phrase. <laughs> um. Yes, I'm, I mean, I suppose by that phrase, again, I was trying to, you know, there are some deep ecologists who want to say that we've got to, you know, simply get rid of any sense of human superiority whatsoever. And uh, I, I think that's not going to run. And I think it, um, it, it, it doesn't fit very well with the fact that we clearly have done this, this degree of damage. And I think it's, it's worth philosophically and theologically reflecting on uh, uh, you know, whether if you, if you really have an ecological view of things, the fact of human intelligence and ability to alter, to, to manage things, maybe this is part of a, of, of a naturally intended ecology anyway. You know, why not? We, why shouldn't it be if we are, if we are natural? And if, if one rejects a surely mechanistic account of nature that doesn't really fit any longer very well um, with, with modern science. But um, uh, uh, what I was trying to suggest is you need to hold in balance the idea that from one point of view, yes, we're at the top of a kind of hierarchy. We can transcend nature. We can look down on the globe like, like a little nut. Our spiritual lives exceed nature. And yet, from another point of view, we're, we're part of nature which is bigger than <coughs> us and which may indeed have something like a kind of world soul for, for all we know. Um, you've got to hold these two in balance. And I think the idea of a, a kind of canotic personalism is what I mean by that. So the, the, the gesture of our, our, as it were, our, our superiority is very paradoxical. It's precisely that, that, we, that we, we tend and serve uh, uh, nature, not just in our own interests, but in the interests of other creatures, which, you know, in the kind of vision of St. Francis, are all praising their creator. Thank you. Two questions here at the front. There's a lady, two ladies here. Uh, good evening, One Professor. Day. Uh, I come from India, and in Hinduism, one of the rivers has a very uh, religious sentiment that is Ganges. And still, uh, Ganges is one of the most 
polluted rivers yeah, in the world. Yes. 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 So, um, isn't this a, a contradiction to what you're trying to preach here? Uh, like, even if you're associating religion with ecology, sometimes humans, because they become very selfish, they kind of overlook even that. Like, could you elaborate on something on that? Well, that's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. And um, I was hearing recently about the Tigris and the Euphrates, um, which are very important for the Shiite Arabs because they have a ceremony of passing the water that relates to a point in history where um, they, were, they were starved out and dehydrated and, 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 and so forth. And they are, in fact, sort of resisting the pollution of those, those rivers. So, um, the question you're asking, in a way, is when, when does our religious sense of the sacrality of, of a natural element, um, you know, inspire us to, to action, if, if, if you like? And, um, you know, if, it, if it's a form of religiosity um, that, 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 that's only concerned with um, sort of what the river might, might, might do for me, or something like that, or is, is completely, in it. you know, if, if we really think that the river itself is, is sacred, it seems to me we should be concerned about, about its, its purity. And I, I no way of speaking to the circumstances of the Ganges, but I think a certain kind of, a correct politicization of our religion at that point is really rather important. I mean, you mentioned a bit about repentance yes. in this whole area, and this is a kind of repentance question in a way. Yes. But what is the agency? I mean, how does one repent? I mean, what, yeah. How does that happen in an ec ecological terms? Um, that, uh, that's a very, very important question. And do you repent as an individual? Do you repent as a society? I think that um, you can only begin to repent by sort of developing different habits and in certain groups and hoping that that um, might uh, become contagious. So that you, you have to act at several different levels. You, have, you know, you both have to um, agitate for big changes, but also, I think, demonstrate how better practices can lead to uh, more fruitful and fulfilling lives. And, you very uh, uh, wickedly mentioned the gilets jaunes. Uh, you know, a lot could be said about that. But I think that what we see in the West at the moment is um, a populist revolt by many people who feel that a global elite have kind of taken off from um, their countries and the, their localities, and they don't care about um, the texture of local life and particular traditions and customs. Now, quite often those people are at the moment kind of turned off by ecology because it seems to them like yet another global expert discourse. But if only we could sort of link that concern of popular, the populist concern for the humanly local with the ecological, which is a more sort of bourgeois, bohemian, bobo concern. If we could do that, then we might have a new politics. And in fact, the people who are reading uh, the French translation of the politics of virtue, people in Rolfon so that's exactly one of the things that they're trying to aim to achieve. That's great. Um, There's a question there. Professor Milbank, uh, thank you very much for your insightful uh, sharing. Um, what I'm going to say, it's not really questions, but rather uh, little points of um, uh, opinion or sharing. Um, first of all, um, Actually, I have two points, but now uh, with your remark just now, it becomes three. Um, <laughs> sorry. So about, uh, I, will be, I will be really quick. Um, repentance is the beginning of determination. Say that again. Repentance is the beginning of determination. And it is out of determination at the individual, individual level, uh, gradually it, there is a chance of a collective level. And repentance is the beginning of um, um, careful scrutiny of one's own behavior to be responsible. So that's the place of repentance. Um, the second point is about um, ecological diversity. 
I would say um, it goes beyond the significance of ecological diversity goes beyond um, whether being sentimental uh, about the creatures, whether they have rights to uh, go on living, but ecological diversity is the key of uh, sustainability in any system of uh, biological uh, circles. Why? Think about um, your flora in your gut. People talk about diversity of uh, uh, bacterial flora in your gut. And if you do not have the right proportion and the right amount of uh, those bacteria, the, the, hum the human individual will fall sick. And um, in a way, beyond our human understanding, perhaps little frogs or little salamander in uh, a mason, uh, basin, in a way, they are important, no matter how minute their po population may be, but in a way, because of butterfly effect or whatever, in a way we do not know. It is important for the sustainability of every one of us as a whole because history has taught us um, lessons already, like um, the diversity of potato strains. If one um, certain um, disease like viral disease, um, if you if if we depend on only one strain of potato, the disease strike and then everyone goes hungry. Diversity is important in some ways beyond our understanding. The last point is about Nagarjuna. Um, um, in the Buddhist philosophy, he is the key person in the Madhya Mecca school of Buddhism. But after Nagarjuna, there are other schools that, uh, that belongs to the tantric Buddhism. So um, um, let me think. Um, there is Dzogchen and uh, Mahamudra um, philosophy um, about uh, the grand potentiality of our heart. So in a way, the term emptiness could be, and actually many Buddhist scholars said so already, uh, the um, translation of this emptiness um, can be an inappropriate one because what sunyata in Sanskrit actually means a grand potentiality rather than nothing. Yeah, yeah, no, I absolutely agree with the point you're making. I, and I think there's, there's a sense in which um, that kind of um, 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 sort of tantric uh, developments, which uh, I think also sort of goes on later in, in, in Japan, doesn't it, as well, it is, is almost something that's sort of parallel to what we call theurgic Neoplatonism in the, in the East. And, and in some ways, you, you, you can see it sort of more congenial if you're looking at it from a Christian point of view, precisely because it is going away from sort of emptiness as, as, as simply sort of something negative towards some mode of action. So that in, in a way you're constrained the extra logical mystery of the world more in terms of how things actually happen, you know, and the way we can be ritually in tune with those, those things and, and help to transform those things. And, and I think that um, if, if one thinks about the ways in which um, technology uh, makes us as much as we make technology, you know, the, 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 what there, are, uh, there are no human beings without tools and science, if, if, you, if you like. But if one asks, how has technology gone mad and seen we can't stop it? Maybe it's because we disembedded it from, if you like, the tantric, the theurgic the ritual, the liturgical. We, we have stopped seeing that the whole point of, of tools and signs um, it is that we're trying to receive a kind of vast sacred back. You know, it's a bit like the Aboriginal song lines or it's a bit like sort of Chinese geomancy uh, as well. But, but we need to re-embed these, these technological things. Uh, I think, within those processes. And I agree with you also about the kind of micro level. In a way, what I was trying to say is 
sort of, if we get away from these fixation um, on, on, on totalities that we imagine we're sort of doomed by, you know, the very fact that humans have sort of interfered with things shows how unpredictable things are and that, that you know, I I individual actors can make a, a difference. If we start interacting, uh, if, you, if you like, at the small scale, we don't know where it's going to go. You know, you, you've cited the butterfly effect as, as well. How do we know that there couldn't be a sudden beneficial tilt? Yeah. Right. Um, we're running out of time. So if you have a burning question, it has to be a burning question, <laughs> you can ask that, because I know I have to get John on the plane at some point. Any burning questions? Oh, there is a burning question. Okay, you're lying. <laughs> is it one burning question? Okay. Um, I'm curious about how, uh, in the face of fundamentalism, uh, I think you probably saw it in Australia or also in the United States, where, where people yeah. have this, this feeling that as Christians they believe that God is the creator, and if there's a big problem, God will fix it. Should uh, local religious leaders try to push back against that? And if they try to, are they just going to lose their flocks? Well, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, what I was trying to say briefly was, you know, that, that kind of theology, you know, that the sort of we've got a completely dead creation and God's a big will in charge and it's, it's almost sort of sacrilegious to be bothered about any damage we, we, we might do. Um, the, tr you know, the trouble is that that's so much in league with a certain kind of runaway capitalism and runaway technologism. And it's, it's absolutely not an accident that the United States is the most Protestant country really in the world is associated so much with those processes. And, you know, in um, sort of my experience, uh, you know, as a, as a university teacher, I would say that the, the right approach is to educate and talk to people. But, that, you know, so many people who emerge from that background and start to think and they get to a different perception, especially when they know their own um, tradition better, but um, you know, um, uh, much more needs to be done. I mean, how how do we how how do we um, you know communicate that message more more widely? You know, uh, I, I mean, I think there are really thinking e evangelicals in the United States, but they they never seem to break through. Um, beyond a certain level and there are people, there are evangelicals who think, yeah, that the Bible tells you that the world has to become a complete, a vast mega city in the end, you know, maybe look like the middle of Hong Kong without the beautiful surroundings or, or something like that, you know, and this is just insane. Um, I, I totally think that um, by and large priests and ministers have a far bigger responsibility to challenge their flocks, even at the cost of losing them, um, that is exercised at the moment, you know. Thank you so much, and we've run out of time, unfortunately, because I think people will have other questions. I think thank you so much for teaching us to be wary of an instrumentalized reason, and for encouraging us to look at religion as a way of treating ecology in a more, I guess, in a sort of repentant kind of way, but also a joyful way yeah. to see the way forward. So thank you so much for a wonderful time. Thank you. Yeah.